Hello there. So, here's a couple of excellent reasons that Boris can use to say no to the SNP and their Indie Ref too. And one of them might surprise you. Firstly, please subscribe and like this video to give my channel a boost. And I'm always uploading new content, so please do check back daily. And a big thanks to my Patreon and PayPal supporters. Although you wouldn't believe it if you only watch the mainstream press outside of Scotland, the Union of the United Kingdom is coming under pressure. And that pressure will only intensify as the Scottish Holyrood MSP elections approach. As I've said before, the Scottish National Party will be out for a massive win of seats and to also win the popular vote in that election, so giving their leader, Nicola Sturgeon, the platform from which she can declare the Scots have an overwhelming case for an Indy Ref 2. And the polls are indicating that the SNP are almost certain to grab the vast majority of the seats. It's just the popular vote that is now in question. And this almost certain victory will be gained despite the massive questions about the probity of the SNP and certain of its leadership figures. And claims will instantly follow from the SNP, claiming they have a mandate for a new referendum on Scottish independence, despite the SNP themselves saying that the last referendum in 2014 was a once-in-a-generation or lifetime opportunity. But the SNP, MSP and Minister of Health, Jeanne Freeman, claims the SNP did not call the 2014 Scottish independence referendum a once-in-a-generation event during the independent referendum campaign. When asked on Question Time about it, she said, No, 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 we didn't actually. But remember, one really important thing has changed since then. We were told in 2014 that if we voted to stay in the Union, we would be in the European Union, and that if we voted to leave the UK Union, we would be out of the EU. Since then, 62% of people in Scotland voted against Brexit, and now we're out of Europe. This Brexit situation being a central part of the claim that things have changed so significantly that it warrants an Indy Ref 2. However, the SNP did themselves warn about this European Union issue well before the referendum. Yes, back in November 2013, the Scottish Government issued a document called Scotland's Future that ran to some 650 pages. And that document was signed by the then First Minister and leader of the SNP, Alex Salmond, but now sworn enemy of the current SNP leader and First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. And in that document, it not only talks about once in a generation by saying, the debate we are engaged in as a nation is about the future of all of us lucky enough to live in this diverse and vibrant country. It is a rare and precious moment in the history of Scotland, a once-in-a-generation opportunity to chart a better way. As well as, if we vote no, Scotland stands still, a once-in-a-generation opportunity to follow a different path and choose a new and better direction for our nation is lost. But this document also refers to the then upcoming EU referendum. In the Q&A section, question number 266 was asked, What impact will the Conservative Party proposal to have a UK referendum on EU membership have? With the answer being... It is the view of the current Scottish Government that the only real risk to Scotland's membership of the EU is the referendum proposed by the Prime Minister. The Scottish Government does not wish Scotland to leave the EU and does not support the Prime Minister's plans to hold an in-out referendum on EU membership. Following a vote for independence, Scotland will become an independent EU member state before the planned in-out referendum on the EU in 2017. However, if we do not become independent, 
we risk being taken out of the EU against our will. This is all in the same Scottish SNP document putting forward their case for independence. And into the bargain also trashing the claim made by Jean Freeman on Question Time. So this alone surely destroys the case for the SNP trying to force an Indy Ref too. Not only does the document say twice that this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity, but it also quite clearly says that the only way to guarantee EU membership for Scotland was to vote for independence. And another example. Here's what Angus Roxburgh wrote in The Guardian in May 2013. To put it crudely, the simple way for Scotland to avoid the risk of being cast out of the EU would be to vote for independence from the UK before the English get the chance to vote on Europe. Now from the other side, let's look at the UK Government Scottish Referendum Information Pack, where it says, And there's no guarantee that Scotland would become a member of the EU straight away. And that's the only instance of the word guarantee I found in that document. Not only that, SNP campaigners were frequently telling us that the 2014 referendum was a once-in-a-generation opportunity. Obviously to get the yes vote out in as much strength as they could muster. Now I know the Scots Nats like to lower the voting age, but since when was seven years a generation? And on top of that... As I pointed out, the voters were told by the SNP that if they voted no to independence, there was a chance they could be taken out of the European Union. And that's what happened. I would call that informed voting with a true choice, wouldn't you? So both sides put their case and the Scots voters evaluated the position and made a choice. So Boris Johnson could use these sorts of arguments, plus the pandemic, to push aside any idea of an Indy Ref too. Now I know that some people claim that the UK Tory government pressed ahead with Brexit, so they ask why can't the SNP push ahead with independence? But the Brexit ball was already rolling and had been for several years. And I put it to you that if we hadn't conducted the Brexit referendum back in 2016, but Nigel Farage was pushing for it right now during COVID-19, the SNP would be the first up there howling it down from the rooftops. And delaying the Brexit process further would have meant renegotiating the withdrawal agreement to include further contributions to the EU budget, as well as rewriting all those laws put in place to make Brexit work after the 31st of December. All that was a non-starter. So, with what I believe should be a no to a referendum from Boris Johnson, there will come the inevitable talk by the more ardent Scots nationalists of holding their own unlawful referendum. A wildcat indie ref too. And then daring the UK government to fight it in court and then, maybe, even make a Scottish unilateral declaration of independence, or UDI. Ian Smith, I think, was the last person to do that in 1965, when, as the Prime Minister of Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, he pulled his country out of UK control and made a unilateral declaration of independence. Now, the circumstances surrounding that case are far different from the Scottish independence issue of today, though. But I'm not sure that Nicola Sturgeon would actually go ahead with any sort of unlawful referendum, though, let alone a form of UDI. But to put all that into context, maybe we need to look a bit further back. According to Professor Neil Papworth in his book on constitutional and administrative law, under English statute, the Union with Scotland Act 1706, and the Scottish statute, the Union with England Act 1707, collectively known as the Acts of Union, both countries' parliaments were dissolved, and a completely new parliament formed under one monarch with sovereignty over both parts of the now United Kingdom. And all this was the direct result 
of a financially ruinous colonial escapade by the Scots into Panama, the Darien Scheme. Here's what Historic UK says about that. In the late 1690s, however, thousands of ordinary Scottish folk had been tempted to invest their hard-earned money in a plan to link the two great oceans of the world by establishing an overland trading route between the Pacific and Atlantic. Almost every Scot who had £5 in his or her pocket invested in the Darien scheme to establish a Scottish colony in Panama. Poorly planned, the venture ended early in 1700 with significant loss of life and financial ruin for the Kingdom of Scotland. With the result that a union with England was formed and the Scots poet Burns lamented that Scottish MPs had been bought and sold for English gold. And now the Scots want to embark on a whole new escapade, the SNP Sturgeon Scheme of Independence. Anyway, it wasn't until the Scotland Act 1998 that a completely new Scottish Parliament was formed with devolved powers under the UK Parliament. And in that process, the UK Parliament retained powers over all matters regarding the Union of the UK, and that includes membership of it. In fact, the Scottish Parliament is five years younger than the European Union. And there are many Brexiteers who are of the opinion that the new Scottish Parliament, as well as devolution to Wales, Northern Ireland and the English regions, was all part of a plan to break the UK up into bite-sized chunks for EU consumption. But that's another story. Now compare the status of Scotland to that of the UK when it was an EU member looking for Brexit. Under the Lisbon Treaty, each member state has control over the Union of the EU in the form of each state's ability to trigger Article 50. There is no equivalent provision within the Acts of Union and subsequent UK legislation. So under UK law, as it currently stands, a lawful referendum on Scottish independence can only be conducted using powers specially conferred by an order made under Section 30 brackets 2 of the Scotland Act, something that has to be approved by the Scottish Government and both Houses of the UK Parliament before it can be used, and it therefore has to come with the UK's Government's blessing. And that would not just cover a physical holding of a referendum on Scottish independence, it would also cover any taxpayers' money spent, civil service time expended and the use of public assets like buildings to conduct it in. And there's also the matter of data protection laws over such things as electoral registers and the like. Hence, no Section 30 brackets to, no lawful referendum. Not only that, the Unionists in Scotland would no doubt completely boycott the whole referendum process and refuse to legitimise it with their votes. There would be no Westminster involvement, so no legislation would be passed at a UK level to support a referendum. The UK Electoral Commission would not get involved, so raising serious questions about the fairness of any wildcat referendum. In such an unlawful referendum, there doubtless be an unofficial but claimed to be official Yes to Independence campaign group, but I doubt there would be any attempt to run a no campaign, and nor should there be. So the result would be a foregone 99.9% .9 or more vote for independence, and as such would carry no weight except in the minds of the Scots nationalists especially if many of the Scots Nats also refuse to take part in such a folly. And there may well be whole areas in Scotland that might refuse to participate in the ballot processes, with the result that a wildcat referendum saw a low turnout, with areas of the country not voting at all. And that's something that would destroy the question of independence probably for longer than a generation. It would be on a par with the current military coup in Myanmar. Most people would probably view such an event as an indicator of what a truly independent Scotland under SNP one-party state rule would get up to. 
but you can still imagine a puffed-up Blackford blowhard pontificating everywhere that Scotland was now free of the UK and trying to set dates for independence while the rest just ignored them. Because the Acts of Union and all the subsequent legislation would remain undisturbed, and as far as the rest of the world would be concerned, Scotland would still be a part of the UK. No seat for the SNP at the UN or the WTO, and no membership of the EU either. No Scottish embassies scattered across the globe, and no grand state visits by Sturgeon. I wonder if Panama would be at the top of her list. But I bet they'd still take their Westminster seats and the money. Now I'm sure that Nicola Sturgeon recognises these not inconsiderable risks, so will only press as hard as she can for a referendum, but not go the extra league of running her own wildcat-style referendum. But one of the things she will doubtless do is call on the international community, the EU and US spring to mind, for help in persuading Boris to allow another Scottish independence referendum although she might find them less than immediately ready to support her. But we must all realise that Nicola Sturgeon, her SNP and their wider Scots Nat support base are in a hurry. From what I can see, nuts and bolts are exiting the party machine and there is also talk of a steady stream of people leaving the party. They also know that every day of delay means their chances of getting the result they want diminish. And why? Because the people of Scotland will start asking all those difficult questions like what currency do you plan on using? And have you got a promise from the EU Commission that we can join them straight away? They know that the quicker they can ram a referendum through and bank a yes result, the sooner they don't have to answer all those difficult questions. That is if the Scottish media actually asks those difficult questions, something they don't seem to be doing very much of at the moment. Anyway, if you want to hear more from me, please don't forget to subscribe and also press that little bell, or you won't get any notifications. And if you want to see more of me, buy a mug with my mug on it by following the link in the descriptions box below and support me on Patreon or PayPal. So, do you think the SMP should be given the chance of an Indie Ref 2? Please share and comment and thank you for watching.